Welcome. We're talking with uh, Rabbi Harold Kushner and Dr. Norman Geisler about why do bad things happen to good people. We're talking about the fundamental foundation questions of life, such as, is there a God? If there is, what kind of a God is he? By what rules is he running the game of life? And is he free or is he handcuffed by his own universe? And uh, we want to pick up from the discussion last week, gentlemen. And there we were talking about the fact of all the things that we were agreeing about, that God does permit us to have freedom. And uh, then we are coming back to this thing, but uh, you wanted to say, but I still have a problem with his being all-powerful. And uh, Rabbi Kushner, why don't you pick it up right there? Essentially, what I'm trying to clarify is this, Norm. We agree that God permits evil because you could not have good. You could not have moral free choice without that. And that the, moral, the good deed freely chosen is the most precious thing in God's sight that he permits a very messy universe to give us the opportunity to be free. What I'd like you to clarify for me, as you understand it, could God intervene and prevent the crime, the accident, if he wanted to? Could he have destroyed the gas chambers? Could he have somehow kept the airplane from crashing? And does he choose not to intervene? Or did he essentially foreclose the possibility of intervention when he created a world of inexorable natural law. I think as I understand the difference between our two views, that the answer is yes, God can intervene, and yes, he does intervene from time to time, but no, he can't do it all the time. If he did it all the time, then of course, a miracle by nature is something that happens only on rare occasions. If it happened regularly, it would be a natural law. So the very he nature of natural the law, time. let me finish, the nature of natural law is that there are regular principles Mm -hmm. Now, a miracle is an irregular event. If a miracle became regular, by definition, it would then be natural law. So, no, God cannot supernaturally intervene all the time. Yes, he can supernaturally intervene sometime, and he has. He did to the children of Israel and Egypt. He did in Elijah's day. He did in the days of the prophets, and we believe he did in the New Testament in the life of Jesus Christ as well, and that he will intervene in the end in a very dramatic supernatural event and rectify these tragic evils that you and I detest so much. So I think the answer to that is, no, you can't tie a God's hands who can create the world. If he can make something out of nothing, if he can create a world, he can control it. He can't be tied by the world he creates. Harold, let me ask a question that I've read in his book that I think that, that you've skipped around but you're trying to get at, and that is, what if he did? In well, other words, why, why shouldn't God, every time a guy picks up a knife, turn it to, to jelly? Why shouldn't uh, uh, some of those things happen so that we don't have the tragedies? You wrote about this in your book. Why don't you uh, give us that picture? Well, there are a number of reasons. One I just mentioned, if he did it regularly, then that would uh, uh, violate the very laws of nature and would become a regular event itself or a natural law. Also, it would avoid all moral responsibility. Once you take away all consequences of actions, you avoid all moral responsibility. So God cannot do that regularly, or he would thwart the very moral purposes he had for the universe. You also say in your book that uh, we wouldn't want him to do that because it would affect our lives and many things that we do. Well, there are many. Are I, I've often said uh, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, who protests that there is no God uh, and uh, says that uh, there is no God and violates the principles of justice in the world, and why doesn't he intervene and get rid of all the evil? Well, one of the ways he could uh, intervene and get rid of evil if uh, atheism is wrong is just to stuff her mouth full of cotton because <laughs> if atheism is wrong, but if he did that, he would be violating her dignity and her freedom. So she doesn't really want God to intervene to intervene and get rid of all evil. Or every time she picks up her atheist fountain pen to write an atheist thought, she doesn't want God to explode it in her hand because that would be violating her freedom of expression. So God can't do that without destroying all freedom. Do you agree that freedom is something that is worthwhile for us to have versus being robots? Well, of course. I think that is the definition of a human being. What makes us different from other living creatures is that we are not programmed by instinct. We become human when we exercise an element of choice. For me, by the way, and I don't know how you feel about this interpretation, the essence of that Genesis chapter 3 is not the fall of man, but the evolution of man. That we pass the border from being simple animals who operate by instinct. Remember what Eve says before she eats the fruit of the tree, she's attracted because it looks good, smells good, tastes good, 
Uh, this is a, a purely animal reaction. I mean, that's how my dog operates. After she has eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she no longer thinks in terms of it looks good, so I'm going to take it. Uh, eating habits, sexual habits, anger, all these things become morally problematic for us. Yes, John, if we're going to be human, we have to be authentically free to choose good when we didn't have to do good or to choose evil with all the consequences of choosing evil. Okay, but if we are that free, do you see that there are consequences that for us to be that free that God must honor our freedom and it does cause problems? For sure, that's exactly what I believe. Okay, Norman, pick it up from there. Well, let me hitchhike on what he said about Adam and Eve. I think it's a little more than this animal uh, state because you remember uh, the tempter said to her, ye shall be as gods, and uh, so far as I know, my animals don't respond to something like that. And he also said, uh, you shall know good from evil, and so far as I can determine, animals don't have a moral sense of right or wrong. So I think it was more. I think it was going from a state of innocence to a state of guilt, from a state of being before God without any consciousness or good or evil to a deliberate free choice to uh, sin, and then the consequences of that in terms of death and uh, sorrow and the whole creation being subject to bondage would explain why this world permits the type of tragedies that his son had to go through and their family. And that's because God put a representative of the human race here, said, you have freedom, don't abuse it. He abused it, and we are suffering the consequences. Nevertheless, in his love, God intervened and did something about it so that we can be redeemed from it. But my fantasy, my nightmare is, suppose Eve and Adam had not eaten the fruit. Where would they be? In your theology, I gather they would be innocent people in the presence of God. In my theology, we would be no more than animals. We would have nothing to worry about except filling our bellies and reproducing in season. The whole capacity for morality, for scripture, for liturgy, for music, for poetry, for art, for love, for choice, for altruism, for charity, all of this stems from the fact that we transcended the animal life, the, the eating of the tree of life in the garden, and entered into this terribly problematic, pain-filled world of humanity east of Eden. My problem with that, uh, Harold, would be this. If man were only an animal before the fall, then he wouldn't be morally responsible for what he did because animals are not morally responsible. He could not have been made in the image and likeness of God, as Genesis 1 27 says he was. He could not have been accountable for his actions. So I think he was already man before the fall, and he did not fall up, as you suggest. He fell down. And uh, even Ecclesiastes says, Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but he has sought out many inventions. Also, Harold, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I don't want to be picky at this point, but in talking about evolution, if it's actually evolution that we're evolving, then there is no such thing as bad things and good things happening to us. It's just the evolutionary flow that's happening for the evolutionary good. No, because along the way there are individual bad things and good things. Evolution, first of all, I believe, uh, inspired by Teilhard de Chardin, evolution has God's fingerprints all over it. Evolution in the direction of higher moral consciousness, of self-awareness, I think this has got to be part of God's plan. Evolution for human beings, I think, has been a mixed bag. We are able to help each other and hurt each other much more than we could have a couple of generations, a couple of centuries ago. But in the process, tragedy, as far as I'm concerned, is not something which happens to humanity as a whole. It's something which happens to individual human beings. The greatness of the human soul is that when a 17-year-old is murdered, we don't take that as simply a statistic. We are deeply hurt and outraged. I don't believe that happens virtually for any other creature. That along the path we have seen people misuse this freedom is one of the risks that God took and that God imposed upon us when he steered evolution in this direction. Norman? Well, I think we have to distinguish two kinds of evolution. One, biological evolution, and that's one question. But I think the more important question is the so-called moral evolution of man that he's alluded to. And certainly I see no evidence of that in the scriptural record because the scriptural record says God created man in his image and likeness. He was in that image and likeness before he fell. 
this image and likeness was marred as a result of the fall. He was morally responsible before he took of the forbidden fruit, and when he did, he became morally culpable, and all the tragedies of life ensued as a result of it. I think that's most crucial to this whole problem of why uh, okay. good God and commits evil. Okay, and let me insert evil. one thing while you guys are discussing this, and that is the fact of I feel that there are people looking in tonight that are not uh, Christian or Jewish, they're, they're of no religion, and they're saying, you guys, give me some evidence, hinge this on, you're talking Bible. Okay, now, Harold, if I was to ask you, uh, would you hold the Bible as authoritative as Norman, I would guess your answer would be no. In a different way. Okay, but then what I'm saying to both of you, give me evidence that backs up what you're saying so that the guy is, that is not religious out there is going to say, well, then I better listen. Otherwise, it's just discussion, it's just philosophy here. Let me try. Okay. For me, I would persuade somebody of the reality of God and the reality of miracle, not by citing scripture, because you're right. The non-committed person has the right to say, I'm not impressed, it's just an old fable. I would point to miracles that happen in our lives. For me, I can believe in God because I'm always seeing ordinary people do extraordinary things. If my view of God is originally challenged, by misfortune, by crime, by tragedy and illness. Ultimately, my belief in God is affirmed by the astonishing capacity of human beings to survive and transcend tragedy and illness. I see this all the time. Anybody who works in a congregational setting sees this. If we are outraged by the death of a child, we are equally inspired by the courage with which children face death. Anybody who has seen a child die of leukemia or another terminal disease, your only thought those last 48 hours is, may I be worthy of this child and all the courage he has summoned up. I see people get over the most horrible of tragedies. I see people put their lives together again. Where do they get the capacity to do this unless God is real? How can somebody look within himself and find resources of strength and faith that he knows he did not have yesterday, but today when he needs them, they're there. That, to me, is the ultimate proof of God. A child is sick, and everybody prays that he recover, and he doesn't recover, he dies. Was there no miracle? No, sometimes the miracle is not that the child survives. The miracle is that the marriage survives, that the parents can go on affirming life, that the faith of the relatives survives, that the community survives without feeling their prayers have been mocked. The reality of God, the proof of God for me, is not in philosophy or in scripture, but in the everyday evidence of people transcending themselves, surviving and coping with misfortune. Norman, we've got about 30 seconds left, and we come back to this after the break. Again, I, I agree with that entirely, but wonder how that can be if God is limited in power. Where does all of this uh, inspiration come from? If God can't know the end from the beginning, if he can't guarantee the end, then how can these people be so motivated and so turned on uh, to transform this experience when they have absolutely no hope that in the end it's going to be anything but a frustrating victory for evil. I agree with his goal, I agree with his aspirations, but I don't think his God, a limited God, can possibly accomplish those. All right, we'll pick this up. I'm sure you want to answer that yeah. back as soon as we're back from our break, so please stick with us. We're back, and Dr. Geisler has been talking about an all-powerful, all-loving God, and let's change the terminology, who's working on a plan. And I think that what you are saying to Rabbi Kushner is that you guys agree on the goal. You agree on the plan, but you're simply saying an all-powerful God can ensure that we'll get there, and you're saying, how can Rabbi Kushner assure that we're going to get there? Okay, first, I'm not saying that God is impotent. I'm certainly not saying that. God has tremendous power. For me, the issue is not what percent of all possible power does God have. It's rather, where and does God manifest his power? And I'm suggesting that he manifests his power not in causing or permitting the misfortune, but in strengthening us to transcend and survive it. How can I be assured that we're going to come out okay? I can't be assured. This is, I was saying on an earlier program, this is my faith. My faith is that I'm willing to bet on God despite the fact that I haven't read the ending, and I, I'm not sure that God has the power to write the ending. You see, in the Hebrew Bible, the confrontation is not between God and Satan. The confrontation is between God and human stubbornness and human laziness. The real enemy of God is not evil. The real enemy of God, from my scriptural tradition, is human unresponsiveness. 
God's going to win if people want him to win. Because we are the only obstacle. We are the only thing that keeps God's kingdom from being revealed. In my tradition, there is no Satan. There is no active principle of evil. Evil is caused by bad human beings. And sometimes evil is caused by sensitive human beings, that things which happen in the, in the run of nature hurt us very badly. And that's why we, we see the world as being such a painful place. All right, uh, I'm sure you want to answer that, but let me jump back to the fact of listening to the people that are in our audience that are not Christian or Jewish, who are saying, let me take you back to a program that we did a few months ago with the representative of Playboy magazine. He said that uh, 15 years ago, that which Southern sheriffs were arresting newsstand owners for displaying today would not shock your grandmother. And I thought that is probably true in our society. So something changed. What I'm hearing from you is the fact that you are picking up what people, what you yourself, are saying at this moment you believe and hold to. And I'm saying without a God who is absolute, it would seem that maybe what you're saying could change 10 years down the line. How do we even know what God is saying? It seems like you're picking up information about God from your circumstances, from yourself, and other people are coming up with divergent opinions about what God is saying. Do, where are you getting your information and why should we believe it? Okay, I could handle that, John. I believe that our understanding of God is incomplete. I also believe, and I, I think I tend to have a more upward-leaning graph than perhaps traditional Christianity does, which sees us starting with perfection and declining at least till the, the second coming. I believe that with every generation, with every advance of, of science and knowledge, we understand God better, we understand the world better, we understand the human soul better. I think there are things that we used to believe were necessary, which are optional, and vice versa. I would not align myself with a representative of Playboy. I think the standards in morality, standards in codes of dress change. I'm not sure that's always progress. Uh, I would disagree with him because I think that my grandmother is still shocked by the things which go on in that magazine. But I believe that what happens is scripture was spoken to an immature people, to people who shortly before that had been slaves. And so scripture had to speak in fairly stark, fairly primitive images, not because that's all God could say, but because that's all the people could hear and comprehend. In the same way that a professor in a university with a three-year-old child shouts don't at the child instead of giving him learned explanations, not because he's limited, but because the child is limited. I think scripture points us toward God's will incompletely because it was inspired but written down by human beings and addressed to a people whose capacity to comprehend was limited. I think the more we understand both of scripture and of human nature, <clears throat> the more we come to comprehend what are the demands that God has of us, what are the things we have to do so that we can in fact mature to become full human beings in the image of God. Dr. Geisler? Well, let me mention what we have in common, namely uh, the Old Testament. Uh, the authority for uh, my faith is found in Scripture, and the Old Testament Scriptures say, for example, David on his deathbed in 2 Samuel 23 said, the Holy Spirit spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. So it's not a question of God inspiring it and then David's words being errant or have errors in. If they were God's words on David's tongue, then the Scripture is the word of God. Jeremiah, or rather, Zechariah chapter 7 says the same thing. The Spirit spoke through the prophets, and God spoke directly to Moses hundreds of times, it says throughout the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me. So the authoritative basis for my faith is the Bible as the word of God. And if the Bible is the word of God, and God cannot err, and surely God cannot err, uh, it's impossible for him to err. He's the very standard of truth or error. Especially if he's Bible, infinitely loving, he wouldn't want to err. Well, yes. Uh, so the Bible then is, is the word of God, and God can't err. The Bible then has to be the unerring word of God. If you have an authority like that, then you look to that authority and say, what does it say about God? It's not a question of human speculation, what I would like or not. That Bible says, 
uh, his knowledge is infinite. It says he's almighty uh, at least four dozen uh, times in the Old Testament. It says that God created the universe out of nothing, that he's going to destroy the whole universe, that he doesn't change. Well, now, that's an entirely different concept of God is revealed in the scriptures than the concept that he presents in his book. So as I understand it, his God is created not out of the scriptural tradition, but is created out of his own existential reaction to a, uh, a very tragic situation in his life. Well, it's not quite that, Norm, it's uh, it is my reaction to a tragic situation as educated by a thorough immersion in scripture. <clears throat> I, I'd be happier not to get into a discussion of biblical inerrancy right now, except to say that, you know, if you're going to stand too firmly on that, you end up with a God who approves of slavery and forbids pork chops. Uh, How so? Uh, why are you saying that? I don't understand. Well, because chapter 21 of Exodus makes laws for how you treat your slaves, and chapter 11 of Leviticus tells us not to eat the, uh, the flesh of the pig. Well, I, I would think that that's uh, true and that that's exactly what God did command them yeah, to do. Yeah, but I'm the one who doesn't eat pork chops, and I suspect you do. Yes, but I don't because uh, one of your uh, own uh, cleansed all meats and said that now in the light of his fulfillment of those, we no longer have to eat those. I'm not sure I want to get into dietary laws either. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds suspiciously to me like God changing his mind. No, he could. Yeah. Uh, you change your mind for your children when they're very small. You say, don't use uh, your, you can use your fingers when you eat. And then when they get a little older, you say, you can use your spoon. And when they get a little older, you say, use your fork. I mean, it's perfectly legitimate for you to have different rules at different times and different stages, isn't it? I thought that was the point I was making five no, minutes that's, ago. No, <laughs> that's the point that I'm making, but it could be inerrant advice uh, and command at that point mm -hmm. in their life. And I think at certain points in the lives of, of God's people, since his revelation is progressive, he did have different house order for them to operate under. And then human beings have to use their informed conscience to decide when God is inerrant but limited to that time well, and when God is speaking He's inerrant at all those times, but when he changes the revelation, and, and you agree, don't you, in the Old Testament that God came and gave further revelation. He mm -hmm. gave some to Adam and some to Noah and some to uh, Moses and some to Abraham that when he gives the new revelation, then we are obligated. We simply don't make up the rules. We get the rules as he reveals them. But I still think that there is a divinely planted response in us which makes it plausible to understand that the prohibition of murder and adultery were permanent and the prohibitions that might have to do with eating leavened bread on Passover or sacrificing rams but he never revoked were temporary. Those, did he? he did, uh, from our standpoint, he did revoke the prohibitions regarding the uh, ceremonial uh, laws, but he never uh, revoked anything regarding the moral laws. So that would depend on whether God did or not uh, revoke them. Yeah, the it? key phrase being from our standpoint. Yes. Which already introduces a certain personal dimension. That is, one can choose to accept the Christian filtering out of ritual and ceremonial things, but then you're choosing, which is probably not a whole lot less existential than some of the choices well, I'm If, making. for example, the choice were based on historic evidence of someone, let's say, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who fulfilled prophecies, literally, uh, to, as to the year he would come, the city he would be born in, how he would die, and how he would rise, and it wouldn't be a choice, would it? It would be built on evidence. Well, it's only evidence is accepted by Christians. Well, even uh, Rabbi uh, Pincus Lepide recently said he accepts the resurrection of Christ. Now, if he accepts the resurrection of Christ, and Christ said, in essence, I am God, and my resurrection will prove it, then it would seem to me to be good evidence that he was the fulfillment of those prophecies. By the way, we're going to have him as a guest on our program, uh, hopefully uh, up ahead. But uh, hold on to this, friends, because we're out of time, and uh, I wish we could go forever on this point. Uh, we'll pick it up next week, so hang in there with us.